We are in Northern Ohio at Area 419. It's an awesome story of organic growth that stemmed out of a passion and a hobby. October of 2016 is when we released our Hellfire muzzle brake. Okay. And that was when everything started to get real. The first time you program a handoff, that's bring up a spare pair of pants, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> this was something different like yeah. 10 minutes ago. That's <laughs> exactly. hilarious. So Craig's loading some ammo for a match this weekend. Cool company, cool culture, growing. You know, clearly you're willing to invest in people and fixtures and resources. We would still be back at that 2017 sales level if I hadn't risked a lot and hired some good people. Hi folks, we are in Northern Ohio at Area 419. Already one of the coolest stories I've ever seen just because it's an awesome story of organic growth that stemmed out of a passion and a hobby and has grown into something very, very real and definitely inspiring. We're here with John Addis, founder, Area 419. Can you tell us the story? So we started as a custom rifle builder, 2010, roughly. Uh, it was just me. It was a hobby uh, to pay for my own shooting hobby. <laughs> So things have gotten a little out of control since then, since we've started releasing products. In 2017, I quit my job to take it on full time yep. and uh, everything grew from there. So now we employ 10 or so people. Yeah. <laughs> it's been growing so fast lately, I can't keep track. So 2010, so your background is engineering, but not necessarily machining? Correct, yeah, no machining experience. It was just mechanical engineering yeah. and design. Got it. And uh, learned all the the cam myself, yep. uh, just self-taught on all that stuff. Yeah, that's so. awesome. <laughs> and so so the growth was not linear, like 2010, 2017 was slow. Yeah. Uh, no actual products. Okay. Uh, it was all just services. So oh, we, you were a gunsmith? Yep, okay. exactly. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah, we would um, do all the chamber work and everything on rifles. Okay. And um, October of 2016 is when we released our Hellfire muzzle brake. Okay. And that was when everything started to get real. So uh, from 2015 to 16, we grew by, I don't know, 400%, uh, 16 to 17, 200 and some percent, and then 17 to 18, it was 160% yep. growth. And um, 18 to 19 will be about 100%. So. Good for you, it's doubling. Yeah, 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 every year. Yeah. It'll start to get a lot harder to double right. <laughs> right, right. going forward. But, so do you have a financial background? No. No. no, you sound no. comfortable on on the numbers, though. Uh, they're probably very rough. No, no, but uh, still, like yeah. you think like that. Well, There's some guys that just want nothing yeah. to do with that, right? Yeah, and I I like to keep track of it. Um, I don't, I spend maybe uh, an hour a week thinking about it. Oh, fair but um, we do a, a company party at the end of the year, and I kind of talk about all this stuff with the employees, how things are doing. So yeah, um, kind of remember those numbers. Cool. It's actually kind of a fun story because I met John for the first time. I think it was at Autodesk University or uh, IMTS. Was IMTS. IMTS at the Autodesk Last booth. Yep. I think that's what yep. it was. Exactly. Got it. Yep. Um, and I think a guy that they work with or sponsor took one of our training classes. So I kind of knew what they were doing. But uh, what I think is cool is kind of how raw the growth is in terms of just what they're doing. I mean, you guys are in a, a backyard shop <laughs> yeah. that you've added on to multiple times. Yep. Um, why, don't you, why don't you show us the shop? But then I think the cool takeaway, not that it's not cool to see the machines running in, in the fixturing, uh, it's actually selfishly really cool because we just bought uh, our Haas lathe. So John had some really good tips on like the live tooling options, on tooling, on bar feeders, on chucks, all that. Uh, but to hear more about the kind of the silly business growth stuff, like how are you handling packaging? How are you handling yeah your operation side of things, how are you, you know, the little yeah. things like, you yeah, know, things you don't want to think about. Right, but, <laughs> but it's, but it's real, right? Important, yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, show us around. All right. This is really cool. <clears throat> so we've got the main production area out here, um, about 1,200 square feet. This 12, house is... 1,200, that's it? Yeah, from here forward, yeah. 1,200 square feet with uh, five Haas machines. <laughs> got two VF4s, a VF2, DS30Y, and another DS30Y, yep. the bar feeder. Basically, every day these machines are, every single machine is right, eight right. hours a day cranking. Yeah. Uh, the lathes, kind of on and off, because I'm the only one working with the lathes mm -hmm. right now. Um, so a lot of times it's waiting for me to do something. Yep. 
How do you guys think about the production scheduling of parts? Like who decides what to run, who sets up the tooling, the fixturing, the parts? Well, that was uh, kind of one of the, the early things I realized about trying to, um, to grow was that I couldn't do all that myself. Mm -hmm. um, so basically the first person that I put on my payroll, Justin, uh, a guy that I've worked with at uh, like six different jobs. I've okay. known him since I was 18 or something. Uh, he's basically my production manager, so okay. he keeps track of how where we're sitting on inventory, yep. and he plans all the what the machines are going to be doing, okay. orders all the material. Um, basically, I tell him what we're going to need, sizes, uh, yep. material spec, all that stuff. He orders it and then puts it on a schedule yep. for uh, for the machines to run. Got it. So, when um, did you hire your first employee? Uh, 2000. 17. Okay. Uh, yeah, so not I mean, early 2017. We're filming this October of 2019, so yeah. you're two and a half years into, uh, yeah. into, a, into a growth mode. Yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, we've had uh, Craig, my uh, sales and marketing guy, yep. he's been with me since day one, um, but it was just a side gig for yeah. him. Um, he had a marketing job and just uh, did all this kind of stuff on the side, yep. ran my website actually traded him a, a rifle for my website <laughs> redesign. Um, Hilarious. So he actually, we're in 2019, Christmas of uh, 2018, uh, it's actually December 26th, picked his family up from Missouri and moved, no kidding. moved out here. Move here, that's uh, awesome. To take it on full time, so. Sweet. Um, what's, uh, what's running on the lathe? So right now we've got a 6061 part for our auto throw valve for our powder dispenser. Okay, so for reloading custom yeah. rifle rounds and so forth. Got yeah, it. exactly. Sorry, it's really scary <laughs> to watch this run. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the first time you program a handoff, it's bring up a spare pair of pants, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, still, every time, it's, it's tough. The worst part is you can't single block a handoff. Really? Once, once the sub chuck opens, it won't let you hit cycle start again. You can't, can you hit feet hold? You can feet hold it, yeah, you just can't. Oh, if you I run see, it in single go... block, once the chuck opens, it won't let you restart the program. Got it. So oh. basically 5% rapid and yeah. is your friend at that point. Um, Holy cow. Yeah, I noticed because the uh, Haas machines come with uh, one live tool, and uh, one driven and one, excuse me, one axial, one radial, but he's got the doubles here, so one block can do work on both the main and the sub like it's doing right there, which is, to me, a complete no-brainer because yeah. you get double the performance or functionality yeah, without... 300 bucks more, I think, for the double holder. Yeah, yeah. So no you're brainer. basically gaining another $3,000 holder for, yeah. for 300 bucks. Here we go, here comes the part. This is crazy. Chuck's out the finished part. Sub comes in. It's the Royal GQ, actually almost the same one we got. Supports actually, the part. Pulls it out. It's gonna get cool and splash here in a second. Incredible. So that uh, can you show us the bar feeder? Yep. I think we probably just missed a. Uh, It'll even swap out. Yeah, okay, so you're out of material. Out of oh, bars, yeah. okay, yeah, got it. I think we just missed the bar feed, unfortunately. But you can hold quite a few in here. Yeah, uh, uh, depending on the material size. Um, yeah, like I don't know. We really only put maybe like five bars okay. in at a time, right. but um, yeah, we run one part out of three inch, and I think we had like six bars of three inch stacked in there. Yeah. Oh, uh, quite a few hours of work. Yep, probably. exactly. Yep. One thing I learned very quickly about lathes is running lights out is very hard to do. Um, it has to be the perfect material to make that happen. Brass is about the only thing that comes to mind that you could run totally lights out. Huh. You'd think 6061 would be easy, but chip control with 6061 is just a nightmare. Oh, so if you have a build-up chip yeah, bird's nest. Yeah, you get nest. bird's nest yeah. like crazy. Got it. A lot of, the good thing is that normally it's not enough to break a tool because uh -huh. uh, it's so pliable, yep. but uh, eventually it'll just start kind of grinding into your right. parts. So. Right. Yeah, well, we that's, run. I think, what's cool about the just doing a walk around here is that you know, the lathes lend themselves to automation, like the bar feeder here, but um, they've done some really nice job on the fifth axis, the rock locks, and not just on the fourth axis, but also on your base plates, uh, just yep. on a, as a three axis. Yeah. Uh, so and then orange, what is that an orange vices? Orange vices, yeah. yeah. So. 
is actually uh, oh, look at almost that. Uh, Dude, this was something different like yeah. 10 minutes ago. That's <laughs> exactly. hilarious. That's what's perfect. So this is our kind of gunsmithing machine. Okay. Um, and now actually we can use any of the machines to do it because every single mill, two VF4s and a VF2 have a HRC 210 yep. uh, Haas rotary with a fifth axis rock lock plate on them. We also have the rock lock plate yep. on the table. So we're making a fixture, uh, one of our, look over here, like one of our rock lock fixtures. Basically we'll set this thing in the vise, drill tap, bore these four pole studs, yep. then we'll flip it over, drop it into the oh, table rock lock, yes. machine the top of it off. Um, sometimes we'll put a, if it's a big fixture, we'll put a, like a big board hole so you can grab it. Yep. And then it goes into the rotary to get all the machining work mm -hmm. done on it. We run the same exact fixtures on any three machine, just depending on which one is available. Yep. So that makes a big difference for scheduling. You uh, keep for parts. tools, you have to set up the tools though. Yeah. Um, maybe in an ideal world, we'd have like a 75 tool changer where we could yeah. just keep everything. Right. But we try to keep duplicates of every tool, if not one. A lot of the tools get used in every single thing we do, so they just live in the machine. Yeah. Parts like these, this uses, I don't know, 26 tools, so it's a big, decent setup still uh, to get all the tools in, but zero setup on the on the machine yeah. side. Once you get the tools in, you press go and it's done. So if you have a tool, let's say idle in the VF4 and you need it in the VF2, do you uh, copy the gauge length out of the control? Do you just retouch it off? We just retouch it off. Okay. Uh, having the probes, it kind of makes okay. sense. Actually, when we were putting the subplates in the VF4s, we had to do some machining for the orange vice ball yeah. locks, and the probe wasn't on the table yet because we had to machine the spot. We would touch the tools off in here, copy all the yeah, length and yeah, everything, yeah. Right. and it gets you within a couple thousandths. So we've actually got a barrel set up right now. You're gonna uh, do that's fluting. That's gonna on get it? fluted. Cool. So, and that's just a support for. Yep. Yeah, this, uh, I should probably check and make sure he's got it all set up. But yeah, this just slides in the T slot. Comes supports forward. the back of it because we're going to side mill this. Interesting. So um, Interesting. get a lot of tool or pressure on that. Is that the fluting tool? Yep. Interesting. Similar. It's okay. A, yep, a horn. Um, that's a 328, one of their uh, grooving tools for mill. Yep. So it's, in a, it's on an arbor and then it's in a Heimer shrink fit. Yep. Okay. Interesting. That one's actually a Mari tool, but most of our uh, shrinks are Heimer. Okay. So these programs are all written with variables. Basically, we have a spiral through program, we have a straight flute program, a diamond, and then no matter what the length the barrel is, we just throw in cool. some variables. And um, that's awesome. So the total fluting length, got the distance basically from the, the collet chuck to where it's gonna start. Ah, okay, so you're gonna leave it unfluted for a certain yep, distance. for that ahead. distance. Uh, number of flutes, depth of flute, twist rate, all that kind of stuff is- That's awesome. Is, uh, built into the, the program. And this is uh, a service you offer, or is this part of a product like- Yep, this okay. is just a service. Okay. Um, we do it on a lot of our in-house rifle builds. Mm -hmm. uh, we also sell Bartland barrels, just um, blanks, and customers can add on fluting when they buy them yep. if they're sending it to another gunsmith. Uh, and then also other gunsmiths that don't have CNC capabilities will send us work to, to do. So the first thing we're gonna do is probe the uh, front of the barrel. Okay. This sets our basically X zero to this point. We're gonna probe our Y zero. Wait, does it automatically handle the taper of the barrel? Yep, right now it's this this macro here is measuring the the Y at the start and the yeah. Y at the end of the That's barrel. Awesome. And then it rotates the entire coordinate system to match the taper of the barrel. This does a D sixty eight? Yep. Yeah. And so that's what's great about that fixture is it can actually come up and handle that. As long as it's a continuous taper, right? Yeah. It's not a compound arc. Yep. Okay. That's sick. Oh, there's a through tool coolant 
uh, yep, body. This is a, one of the higher and higher tools that has the uh, wow. through tool in the body, plus the tool itself is through tool. Oh, the tool holder is pushing coolant out of the face of the tool holder? Yep. Got it. You're not, uh, you're, you're going to work on that. You're, you're cutting. Yeah. Yeah, these tools actually like to uh, feed pretty hard. If you feed them too slow, you just kill the inserts. Interesting. What's the barrel material? Uh, 416 stainless. Oh, okay. It looks great. You can start to see the... Is it a single pass? Single pass, yep. Wow. Well, a lot of times run multiple passes just because we like to creep up on the depth we want okay. instead of overshooting it. But we can run it one pass and it'll be done. Awesome. And the great thing is this all of our gunsmithing fixtures for this machine are built on the rock lock system, so we've got a fixture to hold an action oh. that we can do uh, side bolt releases on. Yeah. It's, it's funny because you, you hear people talk a lot about quick change fixtures. Literally we were in front of this machine like eight minutes before we walked over and they had a completely different job running on it. It's really cool. And one of our VF4s just running mill work here. Okay. Um, like you said, we got the subplate. I like modularity. Basically, our company is built on modularity with our Hellfire. So, uh, ball lock system with the orange vices. Yep. We can drop four of them on there if we want. We can move them from machine to machine. It takes five minutes to move a vice. Mm -hmm. uh, no indicating or anything. Um, and the the subplates give us back the lost space of the, the rotary. Yeah. So the rotary's sitting off the table, um, so we don't lose that. So it's just inside the work envelope. Yeah, because you've got, what, 50 inches of X on these yep. machines? Yeah, and the plate's like 68 inches wide or something. Yeah. So other VF4 there, we've got our shrink station over here with yep. all our tools. Do you like the Heimer holders? I do. Yeah, yeah they've been excellent. Can I open? Yep. Go for That's it. awesome. So you're surfacing in your text along the axis there. Correct. It looks yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah, Champer Mill cuts this and then we're just three axis engraving the the area 419 on there. The Champer Mill is a solid carbide or insert tool? It is. I'll pull it up here. Harvey helical flute, solid carbide. Look at that guy. Pretty uh Damn. Expensive chunk of carbide. <laughs> yeah, it's a beefy tool. Yeah. Cow. And that's in the But they last forever. Got it. So. Yeah, in aluminum. In aluminum. So. Well, it's interesting because there's been this kind of debate. It's kind of one of the things we're trying to play around with proving cut is, yeah. is you hear guys that say, you can't rough with a, a shrink fit. No, no, no. You need a milling <laughs> chuck. And you see yeah. a lot of people who have uh, shrink fits that are roughing with them. Yeah. No, I mean, I can't think of any better way to hold on to it. Um, it's not coming out of the tool holder, that's for sure. Yeah. You might lose a little bit of. Um, just mass for the vibration dampening, but it's nothing I've ever noticed. Uh, now we do mostly aluminum. Uh, yeah. Maybe if you're trying to rough steel pretty hard, you might want that extra mass, but I've been cool. very happy with it. We run a lot of these. Uh, this is probably the most popular tool in the carousel. It's our half inch helical uh, chip raker rougher. Yep. That's the workhorse, gets rid of all the material for us. Yeah, you were showing me those funnels. We'll have to take a look at them. I mean, you, yeah. that's a pretty impressive amount yeah. of cycle yeah, time and removal of, uh, rate. Yeah, so. They're beautiful design. 93% material removal on these. Um, one of these takes a little under five minutes in the mill. <laughs> so first that's and awesome. second op together. That's awesome. Uh, so what is the, what's the ST10 for? Right now we're running our knobs for our uh, Arca clamp. Ah, okay. Um, this is the system that lets you use kind of the camera equipment to mount rifle stocks or chassis. Yep, exactly, okay. yeah. The one and a half inch dovetail started in the camera industry. It's yep. made its way into the firearms industry and um, I think it's here to stay, so. Cool. Um, Beautiful part. Yeah, very, um, on the outside, not much to it, but there's a lot of uh, fine grooving detail on the inside. A couple horn uh, 105 grooving bars. Mm -hmm. Uh, doing some work in there, so. Mostly uh, static tools on this job, or you guys yeah, are doing just the one, uh, one axial half-inch end mill cutting the okay. 
the finger grooves in it, everything else is static. Yep. Um, I want to say one of these every two minutes, something like that. Just a one-op part, we're able to, um, with a raked parting insert, we're able to really? get a good enough. Um, oh, and you don't have a backside burr? Nope. That's awesome. It might create a small one, but it's in a spot that it doesn't affect us at all. Yep. We also tumble these yep. just to get the, uh, the sharp edges from milling yep. off. Yeah, it's a beautiful part. I see what you mean on the grooves. Yeah. Yeah, I think if it wasn't for the grooving, the part would take half the time, but you got to run slow on the inside. So. Got it. So something I always try to think about is before you see a fixture, try to think about how you would make it. So you've seen the funnel, you know what the part looks like. You know, which side do you cut first? And then how do you hold it on the op two? I always have sort of taught the way to set it up for op one so you can move the most material. And it looks actually like it's pretty equal. There may actually be more work done on the second op here. Yeah. Yeah, and um, these kind of lend themselves to working opposite of that mindset just because of how you have to hold it for op two. Yep. If you were trying to hold it here, you'd have to have a recessed cavity for it to sit down in. Um, so it, it made itself easier to uh, do all the op one or yeah the top side work. Yep. Um, and then flip it over. We hold it with a mighty bite uh, ID clamp yeah, on it. the uh, this surface here, and then we've got some little tangs here to Locate. to locate it so we These can chamfer the tremendous uh, gripping power. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, five or six thousand pounds of force. Twenty. Uh, we haven't even come close to ripping one out of there yet. The great thing about this is we've got two of them. Okay. So one fixture takes 25 minutes. It takes probably 10 minutes to change parts over. Really? That long? But we can change the parts over on a static fixture just sitting outside the machine. It takes so we only have uh, a minute of spindle mm -hmm. downtime. Um, anything we run a large quantity of, we make two fixtures as okay. long as it's not something that we just can't possibly move by hand. So. We really use our verticals as horizontals. Um, right. It makes uh, setup so much easier, um, and we can just run stuff much faster. And like this part, we don't need it to be in a rotary to gain access to stuff, but we have a lot of stuff that uh, we do need access to that the four sides. extra sides. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Well, and here you get the dent part density out of it, right? Yeah. Eight, four, yeah. Four, uh, four up ones, four up twos. Yeah, we used to run. Um, six at a time in I think four vices uh, because okay. the setup took four hours uh, really we would have to probe every single center point right uh, and then the second op we were even still probing the the center of that hole just because in the vices it can move mm -hmm. uh, off center a little bit so so you kind of had products start to take off two two and a half years ago or so What's changed? Like, can you show us your packaging? How do you handle, do you have an ERP system? How do you handle inventory levels, forecasting, shipping, tracking, returns? Yeah. Um, if you look over here, this is the very non-exciting part of the business. <laughs> That's actually really... Having to... Uh, <laughs> it's like huge though. It's the difference between yeah. being a machinist and being a exactly. successful business. So, um, we keep all our cardboard, uh, foam. We've got some of our our blank packaging sitting here. Um, we have a local uh, box place print okay. these for us. Um, pretty cool boxes. Yeah, it looks good. Um, some of them we've gotten to uh, putting a lot of information on, so we're starting to make our way into actual physical retail stores okay. where people are just gonna be looking at this before they buy it. And so we've been able to put uh, ah, some other it. product info on there. Uh, to give them oh, so cross give an idea of what else we make. Sure, sure, sure. Um, this is the product you mentioned, the Hellfire Break, that really helped you guys. Exactly, yeah. It. So, yeah, and uh, packaging, it's, I wouldn't say it's a, this level of packaging is not a necessity to, to get started out, but um, I decided from the beginning to, to make it um, a necessity, basically, that we yeah. were going to have top-of-the-line packaging uh, people were going to be impressed when right. they, they got the product, yeah. not disappointed by uh, something got scratched in transit or it just came in a plastic bag with a zip tie on it showing what it was. 
So. It totally shapes that first impression when you when you open up a product. Like it just changes the mindset to what you're going to expect at the next level. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great. It's it's an easy thing to do once you do it right. But sometimes you don't. Yeah. You know, it doesn't always click. Yeah. It took us. It took us probably a good year to uh, to go from the first stages of uh, let's make some custom boxes, order them straight online, low volume, mm -hmm. um, to find somebody local that will talk to us because we're still small to uh to a box company that's yeah. printing cereal boxes millions right. of them right right um, right so it's tough to to get somebody to pay attention to you but it's um, funny because we both use pack lane for the first <laughs> like small volume orders yeah. and you know it's, it's a little bit of a higher box cost but it was totally worth it to yeah. have that polished yeah you know you don't know that you're ordering from a small company yeah, exactly. necessarily yep yeah it's huh. uh and with social media now we we track a lot of stuff going on on facebook and instagram and uh, we include a sticker with every single one of our products. You look in anything relating to, to Precision Rifle and you'll see, 75% um, of the time, you'll see one of our stickers awesome. in the background. Uh, you'll see somebody's reloading bench, you'll see our boxes cool. sitting in the background. It's just free yeah. advertising. Yeah, yeah. Um, no reason not to do it, so. Can you show us the reloading? Uh, yeah. This is really cool, but the trickler, this is one of like, when I was first starting the Wednesday widgets, it was one of my things I thought I should do, which is a Arduino powder trickler. And, Clearly, it's already been done and looks to be quite well. <laughs> so Craig's loading some ammo for a match this weekend. Um, Sarge is in the way No, it's here. okay. Say hi. <laughs> hi, Sarge. Hi. Good boy. He smiled for the camera there. We don't love this. actually manufacture the scale or the, uh, the brains behind it. We do all the custom aluminum furniture for it to make it better. Um, it knew when you put it back on there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, it picks up at zero because that... That cup weighs about 730 grains. Okay. Does so, it re-tear it each time? Or is it re-zero? No. no, okay. No, it has, it has a plus minus tolerance. So if it's within two one hundredths of a grain, which is roughly the weight of a kernel of, a, of powder, it's always happy within a kernel because realistically, being happy inside that window is is not reasonable. Got it. With your, you know, with a razor blade cutting kernels, which I hope you don't do. <laughs> It's really cool. So it's just a stepper that turns the actuates the powder flow, and then the a little DC motor or something that turns the trickler. Um, they're both stepper motors. I believe okay. they're exactly the same yeah. stepper motor. Okay. They're just programmed the top one to run a larger cycle and hit that macro throw, which can be controlled via the. This is a, just a lead powder. Okay. Like you find that he's built into the system, um, and then the second stepper here is being pinged by. A brain that's inserted in the back of the scale, and um, it's something like a hundred times a second. It's like your kids in the back seat asking, "Are we there yet?" Are yeah, there yeah, 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 yeah. And as you get closer, it's got a control where it'll slow down. And so, oh, and cool! It's like a parent saying, "Well, we're almost there." So your your trickler speed slows down. You're less likely to get overcharges because the the poor part about powder is that inherently it grabs and it clumps, and it's very difficult to truly throw one at a time. But it can slow down what it's trickling. And oh yeah, you see it. That's really cool. So you don't have that like massive clump fall in at the end, hopefully, at least. Yeah, you hope not. And so you guys machine all the aluminum parts that we're looking at here. Yep, everything that's aluminum is our part. Cool. So the scale tray, this is actually a Holy maybe our most material removal part we have. That starts as a four by six by one. <laughs> yeah, that's a big part. Block and um, do quite oh. a bit of removal on that part. The actual base that the the. Holy cow trickler is sitting on got some weight uh, to it too yeah and it comes on a 3d printed base that maybe weighs two ounces this weighs i think almost a pound mm -hmm. maybe more um those stepper motors are very uh, shaky yeah so the the factory 3d printed one would just start walking across the table as it was uh, stepping so we've got rubber feet on the bottom of these and adjustable wheel so you can control the tilt and, uh, <laughs> That's it's been, awesome. a, it's been right. a great upgrade right. for people. That's cool. Sweet. So awesome. our shipping and well, shipping area, keep all of our the products we manufacture on the shelves and the drawers. Uh, we sell some um, third-party items yep. that we don't make uh, just complement all the parts that we make on our website 
is your website like a Shopify or custom or? It's uh, WordPress, WooCommerce. It yeah, okay, we'll, yep. okay. It's yep. a pretty normal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, fairly easy to do uh, to get started with. Yep. Um, I don't know. I'm computer savvy. I don't know websites, but I'm able to get in the back end and change stuff yep. as needed. But for yep. the most part, um, Craig, our marketing guy, takes care of that stuff. Got it. But, Does nice. your website know current inventory volumes? Uh, it does. We're not exactly that sophisticated yet. It's been a, uh, it's probably been the biggest challenge. It's been something I've wanted to tackle mm -hmm. and I keep getting uh, <laughs> talked out of it for various reasons. It's, it's incredibly difficult to track live inventory, um, especially when you have parts that are assemblies made up of different things. Right. When you're also manufacturing the parts, if we were just buying items like sitting over there. It's fairly easy to track inventory. Um, but when we make the stuff, send it off to anodize, get it back, maybe some of them came back as blems. Right, right. Um, we start putting right. stuff together, we find something where a tool broke and we didn't notice it, things like that. It just, um, so we mostly go off of uh, just a physical count. Um, yep. We check when we're running low, we keep all our brakes, <clears throat> some of them packaged in the drawer okay. here and then, um, a lot of them just live in the unassembled state okay. over here. So we've got all of our different thread size mm -hmm. adapters. Nice drawers. Um, yeah, the, the Russo cabinets, cabinets are uh, definitely definitely a great addition. So, so if for some reason, let's say you ran low on a on a main Hellfire. Obviously, there's a fair amount of lead time because there's some sort of coating or work done on that outside of yep. the shop. So what what causes more of those to get made? Well, you know, so buying the material, scheduling the time of the machine, et cetera. Yeah, um, it'd be just a visual, hey, we're low on these. Um, so somebody tells Craig or, or Justin. Justin, yep, yeah. yeah. Say, hey, we're, we're down to uh, a month or two months worth of something. Yep. Um, let's start making it. Got it. And uh, we're not immune by any means to running out of stuff. Um, it probably still happens maybe once a month. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we try to avoid it. We run much larger batches of mm -hmm. uh, parts now that we have a little bit more milling capacity. Mm -hmm. But um, at the end of the day, it, we, we have, I don't know, how many SKUs do we have? We have 144 SKUs registered. 144 SKUs, but obviously yes. more, some of those SKUs are multiple machined parts. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, if you factor in adapters and different sizes, of the adapter size on the Hellfire side, I mean, we would easily be in the 300-400 yeah. range. You know, there's a lot of parts. I mean, you can't yeah. come close to keeping track of that in yeah. your head. Yeah, and um, something like this, the way these work, where it's uh, caliber-specific and then there's six different thread sizes, there's two different finishes, um, you multiply all that out, you end up with, I don't know, 50, 60 SKUs. Mm -hmm. And our website, um, that would be the one thing to a full-on custom website would be a bonus, but our, the, it just can't handle the, the variations and attaching SKUs to all of them to Got where it. it can integrate with QuickBooks. Um, so you use QuickBooks for accounting, but also generating POs, we, yep, et cetera? Okay. Yeah, the QuickBooks basically is just our accounting, like you said, uh, creating POs. We mostly use the website to track inventory because of, 98% of the business we do goes through the website. Okay. We get POs from uh, bigger vendors here and there, but um, for the most part, website inventory is fairly live. Yep. So. What's a, what's a stressful day for you? <laughs> you seem like you're a pretty low stress guy. Uh, not, not normally. Um, I'm the, uh, I guess the, being the business owner also, uh, the only programmer and um, oh, really? the only uh, designer and uh, operator for the lathes currently. Uh -huh. So when stuff starts to go wrong on the machines, that's a that's a stressful that's day for me. Uh, if we're setting up a, a program we haven't ran in a while and for some reason something's not coming out right and uh, I'm in the middle of something on the lathe or I'm programming a part, it's, that's when it starts to get stressful, bouncing yeah. from one thing to the next. Um, I'd say we would still be back at that 2017 
sales level if I hadn't um, risked a lot and hired some good people. Yeah. Um, we have a couple guys that when I when I quit my job, I couldn't fathom paying my own salary, mm -hmm. and now paying a couple guys a salary similar to what I was making before uh, because it's it's important. You got to have people you can trust right. to make decisions. I have two guys that. Uh, make decisions on a daily basis without asking me a single question. It's awesome. Uh, if they were coming to me 30 times a day to ask me, hey, should I do this? Should I do this? Um, it's just... Did they? Did, did you tell them that or did you hire them knowing that's what their personality was like? Yeah, I knew they were capable of it. Yeah. Um, they're smart, sharp guys. Um, they're very uh, creative with what uh, they can do on their own, so it's... What uh, roles, if you don't mind me asking, what roles are they at the company? So, um, uh, basically production manager, uh -huh. um, takes care of all the material ordering, all the machine scheduling, all the uh, box, mm -hmm. uh, all our packaging, ordering, um, anodizing, and man, <laughs> anodizing is, uh, <laughs> if you're a, a machine shop making your own parts or anything, it's... It's a it's a nightmare, and uh, to get that off of my back was just was huge. Yeah. So, and the other guy is uh, Craig, my sales and marketing okay. guy. Um, runs the website, runs our whole custom rifle side of the business. Mm -hmm. um, he was big because um, he knows he's. I think one of my only guys that's an actual shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, one other guy is an actual shooter. It's very important for this business because when I first started, um, and I have buddies, everybody wants to talk to the owner because he's the guy that knows what's going on. Having another guy that knows everything that's going on, who can talk about our yeah. products exactly as I could talk about them. Um, I don't answer a single phone call um, almost every day that, yeah. uh, to do awesome. with sales or yeah. yep. anything like that. Uh, that's another one of those things that we would we would be back 40 products ago yep. um, if I was still handling all that stuff. So I would say that the, the key to our growth has been risk taking, just um, hiring guys, pulling them out of good jobs that if, if we would have failed, they would have been kind of screwed. Right, right. Um, buying machines when maybe we couldn't necessarily afford the machine at the time. Um, well, they always say if, if, if you need the machine, if you're buying a machine because you need it, it's too, too late. late. Right. Uh, you always want to buy them before you need it. Employees yeah. scare you more than machines because, you know, <laughs> I can solve the machine problem with, with just, and you know, it's not hard to get a loan if you need yep. to get a loan. And, but finding people, yeah. and you can sell a machine if you don't yeah. like it. Yeah, and, and hosel their value so well. Right, you can right. get rid of it and only lose 20 grand right. and be okay. Yeah. Yeah, when, you, uh, when you're starting to support people's livelihood, it gets scary. It's crazy, right? So, and um, finding people's it was originally fairly easy for me. I was pulling from a, a pool of people I knew. Yeah. Now that we're expanding out uh, to people we don't know and trying to find skilled people for programming and setup, um, we've been lucky so far. We've found a lot of good people. It's starting to get more challenging, mm -hmm. uh, especially with less and less people wanting to, to do the trades and things like that. I don't know. This would be, you know, it's kind of one of those shops. I get to see a lot of shops, and this is one of those ones where it's like, Cool company, cool culture, yeah. growing. You know, clearly you're willing to invest in people and fixtures and resources. Yeah. Um, really cool story. You should be proud of what you built so far. Thanks, I appreciate it that. Looks like the future will be kind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're uh, we actually just uh, put an offer on a piece of a 74 acre oh, piece yeah. of property, uh, so we can do some more shooting and build a new uh, probably 15,000 square foot shop. Yeah, we're literally in a, on a basically a residential street. <laughs> exactly. Pretty impressive, dude. Really. Yeah. I have a backyard, about 5,000 square feet now, Yeah. Uh, total space, but we're out of power and we're out oh, of space. Oh, yeah. We're running on single phase. Um, Everything's on phase converters? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Crazy. The three phase perfect digital yeah, converters. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Huh. The, the one thing that made me think of you when you were mentioning, you know, sitting there setting up a lathe or running a new job is we just toured uh, Allied Machine that makes the drills. Oh, the drills, yep. And they had a genius thing, which is uh, a lot of the machines had a construction worker orange vest, bright orange, like okay. safety orange vest. And the rule in the, the rule in their shop <laughs> is 
if somebody put that on, it means they're trying to figure something out, <laughs> leave them alone. Yeah. And it's like the most genius oh, wow. thing, because we've all been there, right? Yeah. You, you just yeah, don't you, bother me. I've got to figure this out. Yeah. Once you're on a roll with something, you get interrupted and it right. takes you twice as long right. to get back into what you're doing. Yeah. So. Cool. John, thanks, man. It's good to see you. Appreciate you yeah. coming to Appreciate cool. you stopping by. Folks, really cool story. And I just feel like if you're, if you're thinking, can I do this? Can I get started? It's cool to see, you know, 2017, this was, what did you say, one machine? Or two machines? Uh, like yeah, one, one CNC, yeah. TM2P yeah. Uh, in 2000, yeah, mid-2016, one machine. Awesome. Uh, myself and one other guy working part-time. Yeah, that's now, cool. Uh, that's cool. Take care, folks. See you soon. See ya.